welcome, welcome. Our youth are now leaving. We have classes upstairs. Pastor Jesse, it's great to have Pastor Jesse's best friend, Yvette, with us and her family. Welcome, welcome to Living Waters. Thank you, Arwen. Thank you so much. We appreciate the ministry of Pastor Jesse and all that she is doing. I want to say welcome to every single one of you. Thank you for being here today. If this is one of your first times at Living Waters, we want you to know how delighted we are that you are here with us. There's a little connect card in front of you. And um, if you'll take a moment, just fill that out. You can take it to our guest service booth. We can, um, we've got a gift for you. We want to share with you a little bit about the church. And just greet you and let you know how honored we are that you are with us here this weekend. So I told you I was going to mention again about these screens. Don't, hey, that is a filter and a lot of, um, what do you call it? Huh? Airbrushing, yes, a lot of that. Um, I like that, Pastor Dan, don't you? I like the filters and the airbrushing that they do on us. Um, yeah. Uh, but we are so excited about, we are so excited about these uh, new screens that we have. Thank you for those of you who contributed to our new LED screens. This week, there is a team that's also going to be working on the center screen. So hopefully by the time you come back next Sunday, can I acknowledge those individuals that were part of putting this up? Can you stand, please? If you worked this week, Tom, yes, yes. If you worked uh, this week on this, um, we've got um, Sam up there, Leo up there, Al Fagan. Where are you, Al Fagan? Megan, I know you worked really hard too. There were several, several, um, and your, your modesty is just keeping you from standing, but there was a team that was here um, placing these new LEDs led by Leo, our media director, so grateful for the vision that he has for this church and us moving forward, and uh, we're, we're very, very excited about that, so I, um, and in fact, Tom came to me before service. He says, as soon as the last one leaves church today, he said, we're taking a sledgehammer and we're starting in on this back one. Well, not a sledgehammer. You didn't say sledgehammer something. I don't know what you're using, but <laughs> well, welcome to, um, please forgive me. I am just having a time with my mic set. Um, this morning. I apologize for that. Keep sliding on me. Uh, welcome to Memorial Day weekend. You know, this is a, a, a weekend that usually the sales, you know, those big summer sales start happening. This is a weekend usually that's close to all the kids getting out of school, preparing for summer break. This is usually the time that we start getting out the grills and cleaning them off, getting ready for all the barbecues. This is a time we pull out those uh, swimsuits out of the back drawer, maybe at the bottom. But this is that transitional weekend uh, that all that starts happening. And I want to say that before we start heading to those sales, before we start throwing hot dogs on the grill, before we um, start um, putting our, putting our, I'm going to say shimmy into our swimsuits um, before we start making all those plans for vacations. I want us to really, really remember tomorrow as you are having a day off maybe from work as you're gathering together with friends and family and maybe have your the best potato salad that every but he knows that you make that's going to be there at the barbecue. I want us to truly stop and pause and just remember for the reason for the day and um, be grateful that on this Memorial Day that there were those that gave their life so that we could have freedom, the freedom that we can be in this building, the freedom that we can proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want us to make sure that we do that. As we reflect, many have died in defense of our freedom. And as the scripture I shared with you at the very beginning is in John chapter 15, verse 13, that says, greater love has no, no one than this, to lay down one's life for a friend. But this, 
This weekend is also Pentecost weekend. It's a, it's a very um, exciting weekend as we, it's in Greek, it, it, it is given name for the uh, Festival of Weeks. It's a, a major festival that we honor how the power of Pentecost came down on um, those that were in that upper room the, and, the, and descended upon the apostles. But Pentecost Ever so often, Pentecost Sunday falls on the weekend of Memorial Day weekend. Every once in a while, they, they coincide. One has to do with uh, remembering those that died and have given the ultra sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, and has to do with remembering death. And then the other has to do with life and abundancy and living eternal and in a sense it is a day of remembering this Pentecost Sunday so I want to start off with reading chapter one of the book of Acts in reading verse 8 will you please stand for the reading of God's Word and scripture says this but you will receive power. Everybody say power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will, you will, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, in Samaria, to the ends of of the earth. Heavenly Father, may your word go forth today. It's your scriptures that transform us. It is your word, Lord, that penetrates us. And we thank you for this time that we can dive into your word. We thank you for your presence here. Amen and amen. You may be seated. So on this dual weekend, I want to start off with a question. Would a soldier leave another soldier behind? Would a soldier leave another soldier behind? Many of you are in the military or have served in the military. Would a soldier leave another soldier behind? Or would a firefighter leave a victim and not rescue them? Would a doctor see a patient that is dying and then just turn his back and walk away? Would a lifeguard see a swimmer that is drowning and not aid them? Would a mother see their child in danger and just look away? The answer to every single one of those questions is a resounding no. But would a Christian see a generation that is lost and dying and going to hell and do nothing? Would we do nothing? Do we do nothing every single day when we see those that are needing Jesus Christ? Oh, my goodness. Those that are needing rescuing, those that if they die today would spend eternity in hell, would we not offer to reach out? Would we not offer to step in and give them life? Would we not step in and step up? Reaching out is what we're going to be focusing in for the next couple of weeks is reaching out. Our focus for 2023 is reaching up and reaching out. In these next several weeks, we're going to be reaching out. So sorry. We are going to be reaching out. It's so important that we reach out to those whose lives are in the balance of eternity. We must become the witness. The Holy Spirit has been poured upon us so that we will. Scripture says that you will be my witnesses. 
You must know him and make him known to a dying world. You must teach the untaught. You must bring the unbrought. You must seek the unsought. You must reach the lost. You must love the unlovely. You must give hope to the hopeless. That's what the Great Commission is all about. That is what every single one of us as Christ followers have been commanded to do. The Great Commission. Mission. I want to read Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Okay, that's it. I'm going to have to throw something. Thank you. No, I, I would, thank you. I apologize. I am so sorry. I want to read Mark chapter 16, verse 15, that says, He said to them, Go. And to all the world and preach the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the story that God so loved that he sent his only begotten son. Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believe and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. You know, the purpose-driven life, most of us, and in fact, we've done a, we've done, um, a series on the purpose-driven life book written by Rick Warren. I just love that book and many of the books that he has written. But in that book, The Purpose-Driven Life, he puts a statistic that 89% of churchgoers think that the primary purpose and responsibility of the church is to meet their need. That 89% of churchgoers feel the responsibility or the primary responsibility of the church is to meet their need. And only 11% believe that the primary purpose of the church is to reach the lost. And how we should right now do a self-evaluation of, Lord, how is it that I feel my responsibility or how well am I meeting up with my responsibility of sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? Do we really care? Do we really care about people? Do we really care about their eternity? Only a small group of people live a life that has passion for evangelism, passion to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others, a passion to show his love to those who are hurting, who are dying. Do we really care? A few weeks ago, on Sunday afternoons, or late Sunday afternoon, uh, my family usually gets together and um, we eat together. We have a family dinner. And so on Sundays, we all gather together, usually at my house, and we'll have a family dinner. And a couple of weeks ago, one of my kids um, texts me saying, oh, you know what? The kids are really, really sick. And so we're not going to get a chance to come to family dinner tonight because we don't want everybody to catch what the kids have because they're really sick. I mean, snotty nose, runny eyes, sore throat, the whole thing. I didn't didn't want it. And I said, I love your babies. Okay, but you stay home. That's a good idea. But they were so concerned about us being infected. But we should be individuals that are so contagious with our faith, so contagious with the gospel of Jesus Christ, that that's what we should be known for is being contagious Christians, that when people come up to us, they know that we're going to talk about how good God is, how he's the answer to life, that we should be known for this. We should start the epidemic or the pandemic of the gospel. That's what we should should do. That's what we should be known for because this world that we live in is full of turmoil. It's full of oppression. It's full of depression. It's full of so much confusion in society. Can you believe the satanic prop just promotion that's happening in our stores right now. Already the culture going against biblical godly living. 
but it's just so in our face right now. So we should be sharing the gospel. We should be so contagious in our love for Jesus Christ. There is fear in this world. There is doubt in this world. There is lawlessness in this world. Men and women need God. Men and women need God. Those people that are next to you every day, they need to hear the gospel. No man left behind. That's the military motto. motto. No man left behind. Boldly they state it. No man left behind. Well, why don't we as Christians take on that motto of no individual left behind? We don't want anybody to die and spend eternity in hell. No one left behind. Not on my watch. If I have opportunity, I'm going to run to the rescue. I'm going to be used of God, we have found out that currently 1.76 people die every second. 106 people die every single moment. 6,392 people die every hour. 153,424 people die every day. Many of those, they estimate at least two-thirds have not even heard about the love of God. They've not even had opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So many lost, so many dying, but will we reach out? Really, this is a message of challenge. This is a message of imploring you. Will you reach out to the lost around you? Will you reach the lost souls to be effective in reaching the people around us? We have got to be known that people who love We've got to be known, you've got to be known as the individual in your workplace. Oh, they love everybody. Or are you known as the fusser? Or are you known as the complainer? Or are you known as the instigator? What are you known for? Are you known for love? Because reaching out evangelism all falls unto, under the love for God and the love for others. Love is the premise of the gospel. As I said earlier, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's desire. He loved so greatly. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, this says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were yet still sinners, Christ died for us. John chapter 13, verse 34 says, A new command I give you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one one another. Romans chapter 13 verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except this. Except the continuing debt to love one another for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. And in 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 and 8, this says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God, he is love. Is that what you're known for? There's a story of D.L. Moody, who was preaching and teaching and as he was in his hotel room, there was an individual who walked in. It was a individual from, it was a British friend of his that was with him. And he asked him, come over to the window. I, I want to show you something. And 
And D.L. Moody asked the individual to look out this third story window over a plaza. D.L. Moody asked his companion, this friend of his that was traveling, he said, what do you see? And his friend looked out this third story w window and he said, I see people. I see a big crowd of people in the plaza. And D.L. Moody looks and he says, look once again, really, really, what do you see? What do you see as you look out the window? And his friend said, I see men, women, children, but I, I basically just see a group of people. D.L. Moody said, look a third time, please. What do you see? And in frustration, his friend said, I just see a group of people. And D.L. Moody responded like this. He went to the window, and his eyes were watery. And he said, you know what I see? I see people that are going to hell without Jesus. I see individuals that need to know about his love. And until you see people with those eyes, you will not lead them to Christ. These people that work next to you, that maybe annoy you, maybe it's that neighbor that plays their music so loud at night. Maybe it's that family member these individuals that need to know Jesus Christ, but your capacity to love is just kind of limited based on their personality or based on what they do or based on the way that they act. Your capacity to love is kind of, has boundaries on it. But they have families like yours. They work beside you. They live in your neighborhood. They love sports just like you. They enjoy their hobbies just like you. They are across the room in the restaurant that you are dining in. They're struggling in their marriages just like you. They are worried about their kids and their kids' future just like you. They're afraid today because of the medical report that they received last week just like you. But where is our compassion of loving them? of loving the lost and truly reaching out. They may even live moral lives. They may even be really good people, but they will spend eternity in hell until you, not until the church, but until you tell them about God's great love for them. Jesus looked out of Jerusalem and he was moved with compassion. Look at what Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 through 38 says this. And when Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he said to his disciples, now listen to the context Jesus was looking at the crowd and he had compassion on them because they were harassed, they were helpless, they were like sheep without a shepherd. And this is where we find the scripture that we mention over and over again, but the context was this. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field, and that's what we are. We're bearers of the gospel. We're bearers of the good news. We're bearers of God's love for those. He has called us to look out and look upon people with great compassion. There are 3.168 million people in Orange County. I looked it up this week all of them needing God's mercy, all of them needing 
a loving personal relationship. All, all of them desiring fulfillment in life. All of them striving for peace of mind. They're your neighbor. They're my neighbor. But we must love these people. God loves these people. And we must reach out to them with his love and his kindness. And as of 2021, which was the last data that I could find this week, that there are 56,495 people that live in the city of Fountain Valley. See, that's important to me because that's my assignment. God has given me the assignment of Fountain Valley. That, that is where he has called me to be a light. And I feel the weight of those in the city that are lost. I feel the heaviness and the burden of wanting to reach out. Every single one of them need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single one of them need to know that there is an answer and that God can save them, not take away problems, not give them a perfect life, but to give a life of peace. They must be saved. They must be saved, but they can't until we reach out. So I want to end with this. As we need to do everything within our power, even maybe to our last dying breath, is to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want to introduce you to a man. He lived in the 1800s. His name is John Harper John Harper was raised in a Christian family. He became a pastor of a Baptist church in London in 1896. He founded that uh, church, and it's even today known as the Baptist Pioneer Mission in London. With only 25 worshipers, at the very beginning, it began to grow because we find that John Harper had a great passion to spread the gospel and reach out to everyone that was around him. But in April of 1912, he was going on a trip with his daughter, Nana. She was six years old. Do we have a picture of him and his daughter? Him and his daughter, Nana, went on a trip. They went on a big ship the big ship was called the Titanic. In April of 1912, this pastor, with his six-year-old little Nana, his daughter, boarded the ship, the Titanic. After the ship struck an iceberg, it began to sink, as many of you know. The story goes that this pastor, John Harper, made sure that his little daughter, Nana, was placed on one of the lifeboats. But there has been a report, or soon after, there was a report. Harper's final moments were reaccounted four years later after the disaster and the sinking of the Titanic ship. They were reaccounted four years later at a meeting in Hamilton, Ontario, by a man who said, I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone in despair, he wrote, it was an awful night, but a tide brought this man to me, known as John Harper. He was also just holding on to a piece of shipwreck near me. The man said to me, are you saved? No, I am not, I replied to him. He replied, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The waves pushed him back and forth. He said a little bit later, again, I saw him and he looked at me again and said, are you saved? And he said, I replied, no. I said, no. I cannot honestly say that I am. He again said to me, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And shortly after that, 
he went down and there alone at night with two miles of water underneath me, I believe that I am John Harper's last convert. He was also one of the only six people that were pulled out of the water by a lifeboat. The other 1,522, including Harper, were left there to die. His very last breath was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. He was reaching out because he didn't want those around him that were dying to spend eternity in hell. On the very last moment, the very last breath out of his lungs was sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I want to challenge every single one of us on this day of Pentecost when we've been endued with power for the purpose of being a witness, for the purpose of reaching out on this Memorial Day weekend when I say a soldier would not leave another soldier behind. A mom would not leave a child that is dying and hurt without reaching out. A firefighter, firefighter would not leave an individual in a burning building, how we as Christians should not leave anybody behind, but use every last breath, every last breath to share the love of Jesus Christ. Can you stand with me, please? I just want you to leave challenge today. I want the Holy Spirit to burn so deep within you. I want it to stir you and give you a passion and a desire to reach out to that neighbor, to reach out to that coworker, to reach out to that family member, to reach out to that individual that you just seem, it just seems like God keeps bringing to your mind or bringing into your path. And he's doing that for the purpose because you have the answer. You have the answer that Jesus came because of God's great love to save them, to save them. And so what I would like you to do right now is just have a moment before the Lord and asking him to use you. Will you do that? If you can bow your heads just for a moment. whether you use words out loud or whether you're just praying deep in your heart, say, God, use me. I want to reach out. Use me, Lord, as a vessel of your love, your compassion. Break my heart for what breaks yours. And what breaks yours is those around me, Lord, that don't know you. Give me boldness, Lord. Give me boldness to share your love with them. Give me boldness and courage in the right words to share the eternal promise that they have of living with you. Give us compassion. Give us compassion. Give us compassion. Can you sing that song? And oh Lord, don't refuse me. Surely there's a work that I can do. And even though it's humble, and even though it's humble, Lord, help my will to crumble. Lord, help. My will to crumble. Though the task be great, though the task I'll work be for you. Great, I'll work for you. Heavenly Father, everyone under the sound of my voice, Lord, I'm not here to condemn because you do not condemn. But Lord, convict our spirit. Convict our spirit, Lord. 
may we stop and pause and realize our assignment and our responsibility. That if there's breath in our lungs that you're not finished using us as a witness to this world and personally using us as a witness to a neighbor, a coworker, a friend, use us, dear God. And may we take on the responsibility of reaching out, reaching out, dear God, and sharing your love and sharing the good news and sharing you is the answer. And so I pray that you empower your people with the Holy Spirit. Give them boldness. Make them courageous. Give them the wisdom of when and where and what to say. I pray all this because it will bring you glory. I do this not to bring attention to ourself, Lord, but to point people to the cross of your great love. And Lord, I ask that you keep your people safe in your hands. Guide, direct, give us wisdom. In your wonderful holy name, amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you again for being here at Living Waters. I look forward and I invite you to Wednesday nights as we study about evangelism for the next couple of weeks that God would use us. God bless you. God bless you. You may be dismissed. Thank you for joining us online.